be up there somewhere. I got it. <laughs> okay. And waiting for a couple of microphones to uh, Mute. turn from red to green, I guess. Or should we go ahead and start? Well, the mute, microphones being red or green just means that they are muted or not. So you don't have to worry about that. Ah, OK. All right. Well, everybody knows about entomology. <laughs> so I, Bill just came on, so we can admit him. And we'll wait one more minute and then we'll start. <clears throat> Did you want to say a word or two at the end about annelids, uh, Linda? Uh, sure, I can. Okay. I'm going to leave for just a second and see if anybody's at that other link. Okay, I'll be back. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, we'll wait for you to come back. How are you doing, Rick? Fine, except I was muted. <laughs> uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. Didn't mean no, to interrupt you. No, 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 no. That was fine. I just, uh, I like to stay muted. I never know what's going to come out of my mouth at the wrong time. So <laughs> I see. <laughs> it keeps, right. me, keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. Everybody know how to use the chat box okay? Yeah, uh, I, I don't, so you will have, maybe, I don't know if they do or not, they can tell you. Well, since we've got a moment, I'll just, I guess everybody can hear, so I'll just run through it. That chat box that shows somewhere on your screen on a Mac or that I'm familiar with, it's at the bottom of the screen. When you hit on the chat button, you can select sending a message to everyone or you can Click on the everyone and it'll tell you everybody that's in the, in the group that uh, if you want to send just one particular person a message, you can do that. Uh, obviously, I would not see that if it's not to me, but if you're doing everything or in everyone, I will see it and then I can uh, kind of pass that along to Eric because he's going to have his hands full with and Dean with doing their slides. And it's hard to, to watch everything that's going on. So. It's a nice way of asking questions as they come up to you and uh, without interrupting maybe what uh, Eric or Dean are doing at the time. Uh, so it's just a, it's a really nice feature. Okay, I guess Linda, there were there people? She's, she's, she, she had to leave this one in order hey, to- Well, yeah, she, was, she hey came guys, back, I readmitted her. One. Uh, Eric, nobody's at the other one, but somebody Roy's trying to get in. So let me work that. I'll be back to you in a second. Okay, we'll wait another moment. Yeah, the reason why I said it could be a problem is that I had all of the other meetings saved on my calendar. <laughs> so, uh, so I was automatically going to the calendar and I said, you know, if you change it, then you got to you got to go in uh, from right. email, which is different. So, yeah. In fact, I think we have to decide on the next meeting that you're going to have, do you want to go back to the calendar? Because those are in my calendar right now, you know? Okay. So I think we're going to have to make that decision. I think we have a, uh, uh, one more uh, discussion about uh, how to fish these, these different insects, whatever. Patterns. Right, yeah. And then, um, and then we have a panel discussion on local fishing. Um, that Linda set up. Mm -hmm. So Linda is, uh, you're trying to get on that other Zoom. Was that a Zoom that I set up or somebody else? No, the one that you set up. She's try she was gonna check to see if there's anybody hey, on it. Um, Eric, several people yep. are having trouble getting in. Well, I don't see them as participants. Uh, no, they can't even get in at all. <laughs> Well, well, Roy was trying and I mean, I didn't have a problem, but I think I think you have to realize that there's he, a different well, Roy's in the waiting room. I'm going to admit him right now. OK, yeah, he should I, be I don't joining. know what it is, but but come on in. Eric should uh, accept you now. And 
You'll be good. Do, do you see? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Laura is trying to get in too. Let me. It may be the pass. They didn't have the right password, passcode for some the old one. Why that would be the case. Yeah. Can you, can you hear me, Roy Linda? Said. Linda, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. See, I had something like a total, totally different password there. Eight, nine, eight, cent RAX. Totally different. That was yeah. from the other Zoom. But that's that what was... I got. That's what I got for this week, though. Oh. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, sorry, but I I'm, okay. I'm sorry about that. Oh, something happened. But well, uh, Eric, I, I suggest you go ahead and get started, and I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll keep I'm working getting so folks too. in. Yeah. Okay. Well, and if somebody comes in, we'll go ahead and just admit them and keep going. So to begin with, I'd just like to give a little bit of background and quick introduction about myself. But first, before I begin to do that, I want to thank Dean, uh, who's got, whose idea and the creativity of the Saddlebrook Fly Fishers academic lecture series. Um, and Dean will go ahead and host at the end of this meeting. I'll pass it over to him, and he'll give us some information about terrestrials. And then I also want to thank Linda, uh, who's been able to facilitate all this stuff that's going on. She's done a great job, and thank you, Linda. And then thirdly, I'd like to also thank Rick, who uh, spent some time with me on Monday to help me understand how Zoom works. And I will probably have some mistakes going through this, but uh, please bear with me and we'll figure it out as we go. I'll get smarter and maybe you will too. <laughs> and then lastly, I'd like to thank of all of you who are participating. And uh, I know one thing about you that you probably didn't know that I know about you. And that is if you're here, you're a lifelong learner. And if you're going to be a fly fisherman, it doesn't stop with this, <laughs> this lesson or anything else that keeps on going. So um, the most important insects used to catch trout in the Western United States are what we're gonna be talking about just a little bit today. Uh, and you don't see me right now for a reason, which we'll explain momentarily. Even though I took an entomology course in college, I am not an expert and my knowledge level is really limited. Uh, there have been many books and pictures available, and especially online. Uh, when I started going back and doing some research on this myself with the mayflies, which were the first uh, bug we're going to cover, um, I went to a website and it gave me 4,100 photos of, of uh, mayflies. But I also want to encourage you to go online, and Linda has talked about this before, Orbis has an incredible number of videos, and there's so much information that's just mind-boggling online. And so you're just gonna have a little bit given to you today. Um, I'm a science person and an educator. Uh, I have a lifelong passion and enthusiasm for learning. Uh, I believe a good teacher can inspire hope, ignite imagination, and instill a love of learning. But as Confucius says, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So I can see a lot of you right now and uh, I, some of you are coming up and maybe you can see me, but not quite yet. And so uh, I will try and get this done correctly to share the screen. And I see the screen of somebody who's got guns in the background, but uh, let's go ahead and see if we can get these up here like that. Okay, so I can see most people now. What I'm going to do is to uh, share some information with you, and we're going to start with caddis or with mayflies. And this is my mayfly uh, life cycle. With insects, it's not easy because there are over 900,000 species of insects. And the one that you see on the screen right now is the mayfly. It's the smallest of the three we're going to discuss today. And many believe that the mayfly. Uh, is the most important insect for trout that there is. I think Dean might follow into that category, but I'm not 100% sure. And so if you're interested in this life cycle, you can attain it online if you so choose. With mayflies worldwide, there's about 3,000 species. Uh, here in the North America, we have only 600 species, but that's still overwhelming when you look at the different types that there are. Um, and what we see here 
This is what's called incomplete metamorphosis. And maybe from your biology class, you may or may not remember that uh, metamorphosis really is just uh, the, uh, there's not a dramatic transformation from egg to adulthood. So it's mm -hmm. very, very simple. You see a nymph and you see it done up here. Mm -hmm. And this is very similar to the third uh, insect we're gonna talk about, which is uh, the stoneflies. Eric, the, we can't see, the, oh, we can't see any of the... Uh, you don't I'm have... I'm sorry? You're not, you're, not, you're not on screen share. Oh, okay. Let's see if I can fix that. Uh, you, do you have, you have the document open on your desktop and then you go to share screen? Oh, I, let me go back again here. There you go, that, yeah. There you ah. there you <laughs> well, go. thank you for telling me. I'm getting smarter too, I appreciate. <laughs> so uh, as we continue our discussion, you can see the eggs there in the lower right-hand corner of the photo. And what's important to note here I'm going to give you more information about the mayfly than I am the other two insects we're going to talk about, the caddisfly and the stonefly. And the reason is because the, the mayfly is, I, 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 there's controversy, whether it's the most important insect or the second most important insect. And it depends where you fish and how you fish, which becomes the most important insect at that time. But right now, when you look at the nymph there, there's 99% of the life of the, uh, may, of the uh, mayfly is as a nymph. They grow underwater from anywhere from three months up to about two years, depending on the species. And even just the nymph itself can have more than 50 molts. So how do you have 50 different flies for just a mayfly nymph? Uh, most people don't, even the advanced or experienced fly fisher. We have a few that are representative, and those are the ones we typically go with. The anglers, if you're a, an angler with uh, nymphs and, and my, mayflies, you'll realize that there are four different categories of mayfly nymphs. There's what they call a swimmer, and there's a clinger, a crawler, and a burrow, or burrows into the soil beneath the rocks. So those are the ones that uh, uh, are available to you. And just knowing that they exist is helpful when you're fishing. If you fish a, a fertile stream and you step into it and the water's clear enough, you probably see the mayfly nymphs swimming very, very fast. They're extremely fast, like little bullets. So they're excellent swimmers. And then the um, emerge into a dun, and the, the word above it, I'm not gonna say because it's a science term, and we don't need to know it, but it's referred to as a dun. And they have a number, uh, they develop from the nymph into the dun a dumb number of different ways. And if you can find flies that imitate these emergers, they're especially effective for trout, okay? The emergers during one to two hours each evening will then emerge into what we call a, um, the, the, uh, the dun. And they, as they do that, uh, usually beginning in April sometime, again, depending on where you're located, but most of the time in May, hence the term mayfly, and they tend to, once they emerge the, as a dun, they only emerge for like maybe an hour or two hours at the most because they're very, very clumsy uh, flyers. Their, their wings, if you look at the color here, you can see they're much lighter in shape and color and they also, their legs are not as long and the caudal or tail appendages are very uh, short compared to the adult over on the right, which is the spinner. And so within an hour or two, it goes from the one on the left, the dinner, the done to the spinner and they have no uh, mouth parts which allow them to drink or chew food. So their life, once they become a spinner is probably with just a matter of hours and then they fall on, and I'll show you a picture of, of that a little bit later here, but they will fall. And so the antenna, you can also see are very short in the dun versus the uh, spinner or the adult. And the tail pinches there are very long. Also the color is much darker brown in that particular one. Um, let's see, uh, I talked to you about that. And then 
the, the size of these are quite small in comparison to the other flies we're gonna talk about today. The adult might be one to 1 1.5 inches long and the nymph down here is even so much smaller. They're about uh, 1.5 centimeters in length or maybe possibly two centimeters, which is less than an inch. So they're pretty small bugs to begin with. Um, the, they usually mate over ripples, not have to be, but uh, at uh, dusk time in the evening is where you find the most of the hatches going on. And when they're, when they're done mating, they just fall dead. And, or the term is used in mayfly language, they are spent. And when this happens, uh, it's an incredible process. Dean, I'm sure, has seen it happen a number of times. I've been in mayfly hatches several times, but not, I'm sure, as many as Dean. But they become spent in the water, and they eventually, the anglers call this a spinner fall. The best chance to see trout rising to a mayfly um, is in the evening of each day. Uh, and sometimes when you think that they're going to be emerging at that time, they'll actually just take off and go to the bank and into the trees and the forest, and you're out of luck. You just don't usually have much luck at that time, but you can go back the next morning, and sometimes they'll come back in the morning for you to go ahead and give them a shot at end up trying to catch them. The eggs are dropped a number of different ways, but the three most common ways that the mayfly will drop her eggs is from as she's flying above the water, or sometimes she'll take and she'll skip along the water with her uh, abdomen there, the tail end, and drop her eggs there. And uh, sometimes she'll just insert her tail into the water and drop her eggs into the water. So there's a number of different varieties by which they release their eggs. And the success of the mayfly is due to their prolific numbers. They are incredible at mating and producing extremely large numbers. And so they're available you know, throughout the year as a nymph oftentimes or uh, and then just a specific time uh, when they become a dun and emerge into a, uh, uh, an adult. The thing that's interesting about them, at least on the Rogue River where I fish for them the most, they would start and one day they would be in one location and the next day they'd go up to a second location. So they're laying their eggs upstream. So if you know where they are one day, you can kind of go back to the same location or even a little bit further up and encourage the hatch at that point. So. Based upon that now, I want to share with you a couple um, more photos to give you an idea. Let's see, I got rid of that guy, so that's two. And then the next one here is uh, M524. Here's, I selected this one. It shows you how small they are. There's the size of a hook. And this one is not a representative nymph because you see the way Eric, it's we can't see it. Oh, I'm sorry. There, better? Can you, <laughs> yes. You can, you're okay now? But I selected this particular one because it's an unusual looking mayfly nymph. But I, just to give you that the variety does exist and you can see how small they really are. The uh, metric, this, it's using a metric system here. This is not inches, this is centimeters. So, and you can see the size hook that you might need for that. And so that's uh, one I wanted to show you. And then we'll go back to I had some of these, uh, let's see, I hate to go, keep going back to the photos, so I'm gonna, um, to these two here, and then, um, where was it, the, this guy, oh, and then I wanna get one more here, uh, this guy, and this guy. Okay, so these are the next, let's see if I can get these up for you now. Uh, is that appear on the screen or not? Good. Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yes, it is. Okay. So this is an adult mayfly, and you can see the darker color here. They're absolutely beautiful insects. And here's another one. And you can see the color differentiation here. You can see how transparent the wings are. And very little antenna, a few uh, tail uh, back there. You can see how long the legs are. Those front legs are used for grasping a member of the opposite sex while they have sex and they're flying above the water. Okay. And then here's an example of a fly. Uh, it's a parachute dun. And this is the thing that's 
fun about this particular flight of fish, and Dean can talk about this for hours, I'm sure, but when I fish this in Montana rivers, it's a very small fly, but yet it floats exceedingly well. And with the parachute up on top, uh, it's easy to see in the water. And fish absolutely love this fly. There's no two ways about it. And then if you're going for a nymph on a uh, mayfly uh, nymph, this is probably one of the most popular nymph patterns there are. It's called a pheasant tail nymph. And it represents not only the nymph of the uh, mayfly, but it can also in larger patterns represent nymphs of other uh, caddis fly or even uh, stone flies. So um, I think that about covers, oh, I wanted to show you the last picture. And it's not a very clear picture, I'm sorry, but it's a picture of a hatch going on. And you can just see the bugs falling in the water. So that's a spinner hatch. And uh, there's still some above the surface, but the trout just pig out on them. And uh, it's, it's a great place, great, uh, fun thing to be in. If you ever have the opportunity, please give it a shot. So anyway, we will, if there are any questions, we can stop here, but I'd like to, I'm gonna, the next ones are gonna be shorter in length because I just tried to cover in detail. This is the most important um, order that we have, the mayflies. And if not, then I will continue, I can't Eric, see. Eric, I may, make one mention, you know, that fly you showed, the parachute atoms. I mean, I, I will tell people that I have fish that fly in different sizes and different colors, and it represents a lot of different mayflies. And I've it, caught fish yeah. on lakes, on rivers. I mean, exactly what Eric is saying. Um, basically, a lot of the fish will zero in on the size because there are particular uh, insects on the water that may be a particular size. And I'm not sure how much they, they, they actually uh, understand about colors, but I, but I do know that, uh, you know, <laughs> we tend to, to want to use colors that are similar to the flies we're seeing in the water, on the water. So, you know, if you're on a lake, you might want to have a gray one and it's a pretty good size one. If you're on a, on a river, it may be yellow or maybe whatever color. Uh, but yeah. it's a very common fly, True. and it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those that is uh, probably a traditional fish color fly blind. that everybody uses. I thought um, fish were colorblind. Uh, they are, that, they, that's they, what I thought, too, except for the fact that there are people that believe that, that it does make a difference. And maybe, maybe it's really not so much the actual color, but whether, whether it's dark or light. I mean, whether like a, um, a, a, you know, a PMD is yellow. And which is a, a light colored fly, uh, you know, and then you might have a green drape, which is a dark green. And so maybe that's, maybe that's really what it is. It could be the color, color is not as, as much of an issue as, as the shade, whether it's dark or light. I, maybe contrast. I really don't know. <laughs> maybe contrast yeah. for the background. Yeah, the contrast. Yeah. Um, yeah. Eric, can you please repeat the different mayfly nymphs, the uh, swimmer and the skimmer or whatever it was? Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, you have the swimmers are the most common, and then you have ones that just cling to the rocks, they're called clingers, and then you have crawlers, which just crawl around most of the time underneath the rocks, but sometimes on the surface of the rock while it's in the water on the bottom. And then the last category are bur bur or burrow burrows. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tongue okay. twister. Thanks. Burrowers, yes. So the, the other thing real quickly here, since we're talking about uh, fly colors, is that uh, I know Linda and I had this conversation about a week and a half ago, and that is, and I've had it with other people when I had, one thing I didn't say about myself is I've had a couple fly shops also, but it's been years since I've uh, really spent any time uh, fly fishing for trout. But people come in and they say, what's the most important aspect of a fly? The, say, the size, the shape, or the color? And I would respond by saying the behavior, because if you have the most perfectly tied fly to imitate a particular insect, but you're not fishing it correctly, you're more likely to scare that trout than you are to catch it. And so to me, the other two pieces of this puzzle that aren't oftentimes linked with size, shape, and color are the behavior and the habitat. Where is it you're fishing? Where is it you're trying to catch the trout? And how are you trying to do it? So those things, it's critical to be observant as you can possibly be uh, as you go through your fly fishing career. 
So the next one here, I'm going to go ahead and is there a question? No? Okay. So I'm going to go to the caddis flies. And with caddis flies, I'm going to try and pick out the video, the uh, photos I need very quickly here. Uh, uh, one, two, oh, you got that one. Um, three, three, this one, three, four, this one, three, five. six, seven, and then uh, I got those, and then three, five, got that, got that, got that, and then five, two. Okay. All right, so uh, I hope this is on the screen, the life cycle of the uh, caddis fly. Yes. Yeah, yes. It is, okay. So unfortunately, I'm trying to, let's see, how do I do this? There, maybe that's better. I'm seeing the whole part right here. So it's, it, it's controversial, as I said, with mayflies, but caddis flies are, some people believe, more important than mayflies. And it's controversial. We're not gonna, we're not gonna decide this now. The trout decide it when it's time for them to decide what they choose as a source of food. But the other thing here is, the caddis fly species in numbers are almost triple that of mayflies. In the world, there's over 14,500 species of, of caddis flies. And here in North America, we have about 7,000 species. So they vary just like we do as human beings. Um, they're just not all alike and as are the mayflies not alike. This one here though has what we call a complete metamorphosis. You can see it goes from egg to larva to pupa and then to an adult. And you can look at the structure here. The structure of the caddis fly is, uh, the, well, before I get into that structure too much, I'm gonna say a word about the eggs because trout as the adult mayfly or adult caddis fly is depositing eggs, they're large enough for the trout to just just munch on, they, they just love them. The larvae tend to drift, making them an important food source year round. Uh, unlike the mayflies, this, these uh, last longer in the summertime when they're uh, developing into an adult. And so they, uh, uh, most of the caddis fly larvae, as you can see here, live in cases. And the case develops around the smooth body in the upper left around the 10, 11 o'clock position. And the cases uh, are usually attached to the uh, made from, pardon me, sand, rock, twigs, pieces of leaf, debris that you, the, the uh, larva will find in the water. Some of them will even make a silk cocoon like a butterfly. And hence this more uh, uh, distinct uh, changes from adult to larva and to the pupa is uh, the more metamorphic and more dramatic change in terms of the life of them. Uh, when larvae are full grown, they build their cases and then are con considered a pupa. So they, inside the upper right there, at uh, one o'clock position, you'll see the pupa inside that case. And believe it or not, they stick their head out and their uh, paddle swimmers or their legs are like paddles and they're very, very good swimmers. Also, they can stand in fast moving water. They've got a, a, a light shape to them, uh, flattened shape, and so it makes it easy for them to, to uh, survive there. The, um, I've already mentioned that, uh, the size of, the, they wiggle around inside that cocoon and uh, that's how they uh, survive. And they can be anywhere again from a few months to a couple years during this part of their life cycle. Um, once they emerge, uh, the caddis can live for a long period of time when you consider it to a mayfly. They can last anywhere from a few days as an adult up to several months. Therefore, uh, the adults are seen over the water long after they emerge from the water. And uh, these are anywhere from about one and a half to two inches in size. And I've seen trout take them with the, the whole case and everything else, as I'm sure 
well, I don't know if Dean, because he doesn't fish wet flies as much probably, but those of us who have, one of the things that's really exciting is that when the caddis fly uh, female is she's getting ready to lay her eggs, it's, it's an unusual concept, but she'll sometimes just dive right into the water to lay her eggs in the stream bottom. She goes all the way down to the very bottom and then uh, some, then she'll maybe just start crawling out along the side uh, and then lay her eggs there even. But uh, then she'll go out to the rocks or the twigs along this, uh, the, the bank and she can deposit eggs there as well. Um, and when this happens, um, it's, it's an incredible experience to trout fish for those because what you can do if you are using a dry fly, you can sink it and get it to the bottom and then the trout just go absolutely crazy. Uh, and I've had trout just race after one another to attack my fly cast after cast. In fact, one day on the Rogue River, I was with a friend of mine who did a little bit of guiding and I had my wife and my son with me. And on that day, it was what we were experiencing as cast after cast, we were getting trout with um, caddis fly, uh, the pupa like that, and or no, with the adult going into the water. But we caught over 108 trout that one afternoon. It was just, uh, it's, it's a really fun time to uh, be doing that. And so here's the, you can see the nymph here and you look at the, are you, hopefully you can see it. Can you see the nymph here? Yes. Okay. And you can see it's called, uh, how do it, it's like an emerger in a sense. Only just that part of the body comes out of the case. And then here's the adult. And when you look at the adult on this leaf here, what you see is the long antenna, the, the wing structure is totally different than the mayfly. And it's, if you look at it from the front longitudinally, it looks like a tent. The two wings come together to form at the apex, right above the abdomen of the fish. And they, so they have that distinct structure. When we're fishing and we have our flies, they don't look like this, but we're not viewing it the same way the trout is. It's trout are viewing from underneath. And so when you're tying flies, you wanna make sure that it resembles the uh, uh, view underneath to the trout. Uh, and so it like, here's another species of um, the caddis fly as well, the spotted wings on this, darker in color. And they have a whole variety of these. There's all kinds of, and here's the, uh, what's called a caddis fly dry fly. You can see the hackles underneath, which keeps the water on the bot or the, uh, the fly on top of the water. And yet, if you put a bead on the head of that, it can also go down into the water and die and be effective uh, for mm. trout. And I've caught steelhead on that fly too. So it's a pretty prolific fly. And I think that, is there anything else I wanted to say about, I think that covers the caddis fly. Do you have any questions on the caddis fly? I'd only mention that uh, fish also will, will, will zero in on the spent caddis. You know, once the, once the caddis, uh, lays its eggs mm -hmm. and dies, it does lie on the water and the, and the wings go flat out. And uh, I have caught a lot of fish using the spent caddis um, on uh, the Missouri, primarily on the Missouri um, and, mm -hmm. on the, on, and on yeah. the, um, um, the bighorn. So the bighorn, know, those, yeah. are, those are caddis waters. You don't see many caddis on the, on the, on the uh, on Henry's Fork, but, uh, but you see a lot of them on, on, on those bigger, bigger rivers. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Eric, uh, question. Uh, sure. Uh, the dry fly caddis was sometimes, uh, is that an elk hair? You, you, you can use deer hair or I've used elk hair both. Yeah. Okay. I, I, when I was, had my shops, I would time and people had a preference. If they had deer hair, they would use deer. If they had elk, they used elk. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the other thought was you didn't mention any particular flies for the uh, for either the pupa emerger or those stages of the uh, of the caddis. You know, and and I what I was trying to I know that Dean's going to be talking about different flies the fish next time we meet, and I purposely left that out because I also okay. as I was putting all this together thinking. I'm going to run out of time. 
and yeah, I didn't want to, to over. I, I don't want to overload uh, individuals, and maybe what I'm sharing is not of importance to them. Maybe it is. I'm not sure, but um, I, I and I just did. I had to eliminate some information, and that's okay. one piece I did eliminate. I apologize for that. Okay. Uh, the other question I would have is uh, a lot of times when it's uh, uh, the, the weather seems to make a lot of difference with the with the, the hatches uh, light rains yep. seem to bring on certain flies. And it, it, weather is yeah. critical. There's ideal temperature outside. There's ideal temperature in the water. Usually anywhere from 44 to 55, 56 degrees water. It seems to be an ideal water temperature and the temperature out, in fact, even the barometric pressure. When I was fishing frequently, uh, that was my one indicator I used almost all the time. If I could find a barometric pressure, 29.9 to 30.9 uh, millimeters of mercury, that's when I would make sure I would go out and, and uh, give it a shot, you know? And so in terms of general information, when you have a cloudy sky it, and a little bit of rain, I think that's ideal myself. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's a bright sky, bright sky and the sun's hitting the water, uh, oftentimes the fish will go down a little bit deeper to protect themselves. And so uh, it doesn't mean you can't catch fish, you can. But uh, if you're gonna spend the time and go, depending on where you're going and how much time you have, uh, try to go with the ideal conditions as much as possible, I think, anyway. Thank you. Anything else? That's it. Okay, we're going to our last section here, and I'm going to put this guy up and uh, this guy and uh, where is it? This guy and that one. Uh-oh, 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 did I lose them all? Sorry about that. We can't see anything yet. Okay, I'm, I'm picking the, the uh, flies, I wanna sh the bugs I wanna show you here. Uh, four, five, and then uh, six. And I think that's the ones I wanted to show you anyway. Seven, okay, all right. So can you see that guy now? Mm -hmm. It's just a, a hand drawing and I, I kind of apologize for it, but this will be the, the shortest part of my presentation right here. Um, I don't know if that's better or not. I, I apologize for the, uh, the way it goes here. But Looks stone good fly, beg your pardon? Looks good. Look, you can see, you can see it good. Yeah. Uh, stone, stone flies owe uh, their lesser status uh, to a terrestrial uh, emergence. And it's, it, it, this keeps them safe from the trout to a degree because what you'll see is that as they emerge, they usually emerge onto a rock and I'll show that here very shortly. Um, this is again, is an example of a uh, incomplete metamorphosis. It goes from egg to nymph to adult. So it's a pretty simple uh, lifestyle. Typically, these are very, very poor swimmers uh, because they are size of their body, they're big, and they are adept at being known as a clinger or a crawler for the most part. Um, Eric? Yes. Uh, you've got a caddis fly diagram up there? It's, it is supposed to be a diagram. Uh, but it is caddis fly, not... not... I mean, I, oh, I'm sorry, the caddis, I'm sorry. I picked the wrong one. Let me... Uh, I, I think I put it right here at the end. There it is. Yeah, this is the caddis fly. Okay. And, and I, it's, uh, again, you see it goes from egg to nymph to adult. Thank you, Rick, for helping me out there. So this but, is a stone uh, fly, Eric? Yes. Hold on. Yeah, I'm getting a little confused here, maybe. Stone fly. This I stone fly. See, this is a stone fly. The insect is much larger. The adult that you see here it can be anywhere from two and a half to three and a half inches long as an adult. They're huge and they are, uh, 
if you ever get it, I've been in a few stonefly hatches and they are the most fun hatch I've ever been in because I've seen trout and Dean and I had a discussion about this not long ago where the trout will actually come out of the water after the fly. And I've seen them do this with the stone fly on the upper section of the uh, Rogue River there. But uh, at any rate, that's another issue. Uh, there, the adult is probably the most important part of the uh, life cycle here. Uh, and when laying their eggs um, after mating, the stone fly will kind of flutter along the surface of the water and it creates a motion that's capable of drawing huge strikes from extremely large trout. Um, and uh, it, it, given the opportunity, um, once they emerge from the nymph form, they usually last maybe they're a month at the most probably. So they, they uh, last longer than the mayflies, but there's a lot fewer of them. But when you're in a hatch, uh, you don't care. They, uh, they're, they uh, trout just love these things because they're so big and juicy. I've caught trout in a hatch with these stoneflies where they're coming out their gills, the sides of their gills. The, the bugs, they're, they're so full and their bellies are just hanging out from them. They're just, they like pigs. They're, they're, they're in, unbelievable. The, uh, let's see if I can go back here. Here's an example of, uh, you can see how large they are here. Size four hook up to a 10. So they come in different sizes. And here's another one here. It's a smaller one. You find the smaller stone flies in the Midwest and on the East Coast. And those in those locations, not always, but tend to be more of a black, dark color stone fly. Okay. And shoots. This one here yellow is Sally. what's called a yellow Sally. Mm -hmm. And you'll find it on the West Coast here as well. And uh, they're beautiful insects. Here's another small uh, nymph, stone fly nymph. And then, of course, this is one I've seen up along the Rogue River. It's a kind of a yellow body, yellow and black body. And you, it emerges from the water out onto the stone just like this. And um, they're incredible. If, if the fish could get to them, they'd probably gobble them up right there. So um, trying to think, oh, you know what? I had some, I had some pictures of, uh, well, anyway, I think... Uh, yeah, here's, um, well, there's the caddis, and I showed a couple of the stone flies. Yeah, I showed a couple of them. Okay, I think that, I guess the next thing I want to do is just share with you what I consider to be the most important flies that I always have with me, and that is the, very quickly here, um, where to go, this one, and then this one, oh, that one, and that one, and that one, and this one. Okay, so this one here, uh, Dean and I were talking about it before everybody joined, is called a San Juan worm. And I've seen it tied a lot of different ways and uh, it just a squirmy wormy, basically. But it's, it's, it, it'll work sometimes when nothing else is working. Fishing along the bottom, fish love it, okay? And then here's your pheasant tail nymph, uh, which is reminiscent of many different nymph patterns. And uh, it's, uh, it's, I, I think it's uh, an incredible fly. In terms of dry flies, you got the parachute again, done. And then the caddis fly, I just, because I fish so much with it, I guess. And then the, this one here is my number one fly. It's called a gold rib hare's ear. And this one here has what's called a bead head uh, just behind the eye there. And that helps it sink down. Now these here, just one quick mention, notice the barb down here on the hook. I, I don't fish with barbed hooks. I debarb everything. And there's several reasons for that. Number one, it's easier to hook the fish because the whatever tissue you're hooked into does not have to go over that barb. And it's just a matter of physics. You take a barb hook like that, put it through a piece of paper, debarb it, put it through a piece of paper again, and you'll see it's much easier to penetrate the paper without the barb being there. So that's always important. 
when you go fishing, wherever you go, I'm just about done here. I thank you for bearing with me. Uh, my habit is to always go to a fly shop and inquire what flies are most successful and where is the best spot to fish them. The fly shops want to help you be successful. That's how they stay in business. So pay, give them their due. And then when fishing new locations, I like to use a guide at least one day to learn where or how to fish where I'm trying to learn to fish. And then appropriately release whatever you catch for two reasons. Number one, it protects the habitat. And number two, it's your gift to another fisherman. Uh, the fourth comment I wanted to make here, don't overplay the fish once it's hooked. What happens is when you hook the fish, it, it's trying to get off, it's, it's physically exhausting itself, and the lactic acid builds up in it. And if you play it too long, it'll build up and the fish will just die anyway. And lastly, I'd just like to say that uh, visit the Orvis website, so much information there. Dean, you want me to, are there any questions here or should I turn over to Dean? Okay, Dean, uh, you are right here and you are now the host. Okay. Um, the only other fly that I would mention that, that I use as a dry is a midge, um, which is basically a, it's a relative of the common house fly. But I do, I do find that on the San Juan, you don't see um, mayflies. You do see some caddis, but you see a ton of midges. And uh, so on, on the San Juan, which is the closest big river near us that we fish a lot, um, you need to have midges. Uh, both in the uh, uh, in the nymph, you know, in, in small nymphs, and also uh, as uh, as dry flies. So I just want to mention, I just mentioned that. Um, okay, so hoppers. Uh, I wanted to to say that uh, I think at certain times of the year um, you're between hatches of mayflies or whatever, and um, um, the, the, the fish will begin to look at uh, things that are falling into the water, uh, like hoppers, you know, which uh, will fly out over the water and fall sometimes, and then they'll struggle on the water. Uh, ants will fall, fall into the water. Um, beetles, uh, crickets, um, cicadas, those are the, the primary, I think, uh, types of uh, uh, what we call terrestrials. Uh, that uh, that fish will will uh, you know um, zero in on at certain times of the year. Uh, there is one one place I know that I fish in the east. Um, it's a spring creek, and at uh, I can't remember exactly when this was, but there's a, there's a certain month of the year when you have all these uh, uh, green uh, green colored. Uh, it's like caterpillars, little little tiny caterpillars that fall in the water, and and the, and the trout just go crazy uh, over those, and they, uh, you know, they they just gobble them up like a dry fly. So you know, you can have some of those. Um, I'm going to show you if I can share. This will take a minute for it to come up. This is on the Cabela site, and this is just a selection of, of uh, terrestrials. I mean, if you go there, you know, you have all kinds of uh, packages of different kinds of flies, and these are the terrestrials. So you, you'll see that these are basically representing uh, hoppers, um, different kinds of hopper patterns. Um, you've got uh, basically ants, black ant, red ant, um, and the beetles right here, this is the beetle. And you can see that in the beetles, for example, is black. So they put on, they have a, a, a red or sometimes it's yellow uh, uh, paint on top so that you can actually see it. Uh, this one, for example, you can see better. <clears throat> this is actually a, a fly that would probably catch more fish because it looks more realistic. But the problem is you can hardly see it. So um, what I do is I'll, I'll get some, uh, some yellow paint, um, I, I don't know, it's hobby paint or whatever, 
and I'll put a dot right on the top so that it, you can see it a lot easier. Uh, because if, you, if you're trying to fish something like this or something like this, it's very difficult to see in the water. The thing about these, uh, these flies is that uh, uh, John McDaniel, who's one of the, the top guides uh, on the Henry's Fork, um, he talks about the fact that at certain times of the year, uh, that's all he does is he flies, he, uh, he fishes terrestrials because uh, there's nothing else going on. Um, and he knows that if he, if he fishes a terrestrial um, uh, in the middle of the day, uh, he has a chance of catching a big fish. And, um, and so therefore, I would say that you need to have uh, hoppers, um, ants, different colored ants, red, red ants, uh, black ants, uh, beetles, uh, brown beetles, black beetles. Um, and I don't have a picture of one here, but uh, cicadas. Uh, on the Green River, there is, there is a, um, uh, a cicada um, hatch that, that takes place and, um, and they're huge. Um, this is up in Utah. And I know that uh, when, when they're on the water, uh, you, you're gonna see just like when, uh, when Eric was talking about the stoneflies, um, you know, the, the trout are opportunistic and when they see something that's larger, uh, they realize that they're gonna get a lot more protein or a lot more calories. And so therefore they really zero in on those larger uh, flies. And so something like this, uh, which is a hopper, um, a large hopper, they will actually uh, favor that over even the mayfly. I mean, if, if there's a hatch going on and, uh, and you happen to, uh, to make a cast with something like that, uh, they may turn to the, the, hop, the hopper imitation and, and, and just go after it because it looks like a big piece of food that, that they do see in the water. Um, so, so these are the things that I think you have to realize is that trout, um, trout are always going to uh, look for things that are gonna give them more calories for the amount of energy they need to expend. And so therefore, um, I think having these in your fly box are gonna be important to have uh, when nothing else is going on. I, I know a friend of mine, um, he's, he's from Japan. Uh, he was on the Missouri uh, and, and he had a good friend of his who was a real entomologist. And, uh, and they, they were at a spot where they could see a huge fish rising, but they could not figure out what the fish was eating uh, because there was no hatch going on. And, um, and this entomologist, uh, he always carries a, a pair of binoculars. And by the way, there are a lot of fishermen that carry binoculars. And this particular guy had a pair of binoculars and he kept focusing on where that trout was rising. And, um, you know, he, he, told his, he told his friend, uh, they're eating ants. They're eating big, big, big black ants that they couldn't see. And so, uh, you know, he put on an ant and he caught the fish. Uh, so I think the, the, the main thing that I wanted to point out is that, um, you know, given the, the relative importance of terrestrials, I think it's good to have them in your fly box. And, uh, you know, when nothing else is going on, uh, you can put on a hopper and uh, make a cast to a bank. And you know, <laughs> I know a, a good friend of mine who catches a lot of fish that way. And I think that uh, um, it's a good thing to, you know, to be aware of. So um, that's, that's it from my end. Um, I think uh, in two weeks, we're gonna talk about fishing uh, these particular types of insects. And um, they, they have different behavior. And so therefore when you're fishing uh, with your flies, you know, there are certain things that you would do um, with regard to the flies in order to, in order to catch a fish. Uh, in terms of behavior. So I'll, I'll be talking about that in, in two weeks. Um, and other than that, uh, are there any other questions? Uh, and Linda, did you have any comments that you need to make about the other meeting that you wanted to? Uh, I'm not sure if they contacted you or not. Uh, yeah, I can say a few things. Um, first, I'd just like to, uh, since Eric gave me the opportunity, I'll just uh, tell you guys for anybody who is interested in um, just practicing here in Saddlebrook at the HOA One Ponds, um, probably the most um, prolific catcher for me is either the woolly bugger or the squirmy wormy. And the squirmy wormy made out of silicone, which is really um, 
really jiggles a lot when it's in the water. Um, but honestly, I've caught uh, bass and bluegill on and catfish on everything. Um, I've caught bass on caddis and BWOs, uh, bluegills on gold ribbed hares ear. Um, Dave, uh, I forget his last name right now, but Dave catches a lot on poppers. Uh, I've caught a couple, not had a lot of luck. A lot on foam and deer hair beetles. Um, I go to YouTube. Joe Marisi and I uh, took a class down at um, Dry Creek Outfitters uh, over four nights and learned how to basically tie. And I've just gone crazy with it. I love it. It brings me a lot closer to, um, I think, the sport and it's helped me understand a lot more. Um, and so I go to YouTube and look up um, stuff to tie. And there's one that says, a video says fly fishing for giant carp. And that's been fabulous for catching bluegills when they're, um, when they're rising and they do rise. They, they rose like crazy here uh, in the fall in the HOA one uh, biggest pond here in Saddlebrook. So um, if anybody is interested in, in any of that and me sharing any of those videos, let me know. Um, speaking of video, Eric, you should be able to, Rick can help you if, if you don't know where it is, but you should be able to get a link to the video or to be able to send me the video. And then I can post it um, on the YouTube, our YouTube channel. We do have a Saddlebrook Fly Fishers YouTube channel and uh, then more people can see this. And I'm sure that they will want to watch it. You, you guys did an awesome job. Um, thank you so very much. That was easy even for a neophyte to understand. So I appreciate it. And I think it was the important information. And lastly, um, I did get contacted back with BioInfo from Jeff Collins. Um, I'll reach out again to, uh, I, I appreciate you reaching out, Dean. I'll reach out again to Mike Falkenberry, but we are on, uh, what was it, February 24th? I think, I think so, yeah. gonna have um, a session, um, a fifth session, which will be about uh, fly fishing locally and throughout Arizona. And uh, this will be two experts. Um, one was the previous president of Old Pueblo Trout Unlimited. And he has a Facebook page with 500 um, followers that is about float tubes and uh, inflatables. And that's how they like to do their fly fishing. In fact, I had bought it at float tube uh, when I first was so enthusiastic and I went out and tried it a little bit when I first was enthusiastic. I think I'm still enthusiastic about this, but um, <laughs> I went out and tried it uh, uh, a few times and I just, it wasn't my thing. So I actually sold this guy my float tube and I see him all the time now out using it on Facebook. Yeah, I, I've tried it, but I don't like them because you got to walk in backwards, yeah. you know, you got to have flippers on your feet and all just this Just too stuff. much junk. It's just too, you're, I think you're too encumbered, yeah. you know? And then I think about something biting my legs or I don't know, but anyway, <laughs> um, uh, it wasn't my thing and I'm happy it's being used now. Uh, but anyway, they're going to they're gonna come on and talk to us about uh, where to go in Arizona. And like Mike Falkenberry said, who has tons of experience, um, if you can, he says, if you can fly fish in Arizona because of our limited opportunities and because of all the pressure that our waters get, if you can successfully catch trout in Arizona, you can do it anywhere. Yeah. So um, that's a good, I think that's a good, you know, thing to keep in mind. Uh, I hope it's true. If it's not, we'll figure it out. But um, I look forward to folks participating. It must be a common saying because they say the same thing about Pennsylvania. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Everybody says that. All right. <laughs> because, you know, there you've got all those spring creeks, but those spring creeks are pounded by so many fishermen that it's very difficult because those, those, those fish become so used to, uh, you know, all these different fishermen, they get, they get very skittish. Well, I, I also participate, uh, sign up for the old Pueblo, not old Pueblo, there's the Trout Unlimited Forum, community forum. And so mm -hmm. I read the post there every morning. And we all know that that pressure this year has been like no other, you know, yeah. during the pandemic. So yeah. it's going to be a different world out there when we finally were able to go. I did have one other comment I wanted to to uh, to ask the, uh, the people that are on, on this particular uh, lecture. We have seven uh, sessions that were reserved. So we have two more at the end after, after the last one with the panel. And I, I was thinking about this and I was wondering if there was anybody uh, who was interested in learning more about saltwater fishing for, um, you know, um, basically fish that are like in the Bahamas or Mexico or Venezuela or whatever. Um, uh, I, I normally go on at least one or 
maybe two trips a year uh, to down to Mexico. I've been to the Bahamas, to Venezuela, to Brazil, to a lot of different places. And um, it's a different kind of fishing than, uh, than dry fly fishing. So I didn't know whether it was, uh, there was an interest in it or not, but I, I thought maybe we could just reach out to people and see if there was an interest and then uh, maybe try to schedule something um, about saltwater. Well, I like it. Anybody else? Oh yeah, me. <laughs> I, I've tried to get a billfish on a fly rod for about oh, those are years. Good. Huh? I have a friend who caught a uh, who caught a uh, uh, a tuna oh, on would the be fly rod, my... and after an hour and a half, he told he told <laughs> the guy to, he said cut the line because he said I can't I can't take it anymore. I mean it was just they wear you out. Uh, I have it was, a it was out it was out in the Atlantic. I mean it was beyond the I don't they went pretty far out and uh, yeah. he hooked one but he could never get it in. I mean, it was yeah. just so powerful that he could never oh. get the fish in. Um, yeah. Dean, if, if you uh, don't already have something in mind for the seventh, um, Barry Sherman tried to connect tonight, but he was unable to, but um, he did a presentation a while back uh, at one of our you know Zoom attempts at a club meeting mm -hmm. uh, on the San Juan. And he has a pre-built um, presentation he That's could great. give and That's you great. could yeah. weigh in and whoever else has fished out there, that would be, what do you think about that? That's great. Yeah, I mean, okay. I, that, that's the place that I go to. I've never fished, uh, the only place I've ever fished in Arizona is up by the, um, you know, the dam, um, the Glen Canyon Dam. Up East there. Ferry. Yeah, Glen Ferry Dam. I, I fished up there, uh, but I haven't fished anywhere else in, in, in Arizona. And, um, but when we do go anywhere, we normally drive, it takes a day to get up there, but we go, go up to, uh, San Juan, and I've been doing that ever since 1991, <laughs> so for a long time. So, so I'm going to uh, put Barry in in touch with you, and you guys can talk about. Yeah, that'd be fine. That'd okay. Be fine. Yeah, cool. and then if there's an interest in saltwater, maybe the last session we can just just you know share some things about saltwater and what's in, what's involved in terms of equipment and uh, you know what's involved with the kind of of uh, casting and flies and things that you know that go on with that. But um, but I and I I'm, I'm happy to do that. But um, wh why don't we send out a, a memo to the to the uh, club and just see if there is an interest and then we can have a final session. Okay. Okay. Great job. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Eric. Take care. Thank you. Right. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah, bye. bye.